Welcome to program number five in the Words of Wisdom series on Shalom World. My name is Father Mark Byrne. I'm a priest of the Society of Our Lady of the Most Holy Trinity, and I'm based here in Waterford Lismore Diocese in the sunny southeast of Ireland. In this fifth program, examining how Jesus is calling us deeper into his divinity in the Blessed Sacrament, with the promise of making us a living Eucharist, we will get onto a little more serious topic. The title of this program is Beware the Roving Horseman, the warning that comes to us from the book of Revelation. Earlier in the program, I mentioned a warning that Jesus himself gave after having fed the huge crowd with the five loaves and fishes. They came after him looking for more. And he said to them, do not work for food that cannot last, but work for food that endures to eternal life. The Greek word for work is ergazomai. And that word means to make gains by trading, to acquire something. How do we work for the Eucharist? when it seems that all we do is stand in line and just put out our hand or our tongue to receive Jesus in Holy Communion. We work for the food that is Jesus the same way as we work on any friendship. For example, on a healthy marriage. Work is required by two people in order to grow in relationship together. Their work bears fruit in a living friendship in intimacy and love of each other. It is delightful work, this work we love to do so much that we don't even notice the effort required. There's a famous line from Shakespeare's Macbeth that says, the work we delight in, physics pain. Physics is an old English word meaning to cure. The work we delight in cures our pain. It means that if we love doing something, then the difficulties are lessened. We're talking about a cooperative labor between me and the Lord, who bore me on his shoulders on Good Friday, and now asked me to carry his easy yoke and light burden. This cooperative work of carrying the cross, the tree of life, bears a most wondrous fruit. I am changed into him who became a man like me. When Jesus is loved like this in the Eucharist, he yields his secrets and his mystery. Jesus talks about spending the day with him in the Eucharist. You can compare the Eucharistic day of Jesus to his whole life as if it was compacted together. Jesus lives in our tabernacles as a prisoner of love, so we can live free as children of God. Each day he repeats in the 24 hours his life of 33 years on earth within the simple host in the tabernacle. We can say that his day begins with his conception and that the sacramental appearance of bread and wine are in a poetic way like the swaddling clothes in which Mary wrapped him and bound him at his birth. Then when he's forgotten and left alone in the tabernacle with only a rare visit from some loving soul to keep him company, that's a repeat of his exile in Egypt when he knew only the company of Mary and St. Joseph. And so on with his long sojourn in Nazareth of 30 years and the misunderstandings of the local people. And when people approach to hear him in his word, 
and to receive him in Holy Communion at Mass, it's as if he's making his public life again, repeating the different gospel scenes of his mission, handing to each one his teachings, the aid they need, the comforts they look for. He acts as shepherd, as teacher, as physician, and also as judge. Thus he passes his day in the tabernacle, waiting for everyone and doing good to everyone. And when nobody wants him, he feels a desert around him and he remains alone in prayer. He suffers the solitude of his days that passed in the desert on this earth and the weight of sorrow as his heart beats with jealous love and watches out for our company. And there is no day that does not end with the offenses of ungrateful souls, especially those who receive him sacrilegiously. And they crucify him again and put him to death on the cross. It is in the sacrament of love that he undergoes death again without mercy because of sacrilege. So in every tabernacle, he passes the day repeating all he did in the 33 years of his mortal life. And since the purpose of his life was the will of his heavenly father on earth as in heaven, Thus, in that little host, he implores us to be one with him in his will. If we are united with him in his Eucharistic day, we can also make the Father's will known and loved on earth as in heaven. And we can say, I make my day with Jesus in the Eucharist. It is a fullness of life. The alternative to life is death. We are, the Lord says, to choose between life and death, between blessing and curse. There is a cemetery in the town of Drumcliff in County Sligo, underneath the shadow of the great Ben Bulban. And there, on the tombstone of the Irish Nobel laureate, the poet W.B. Yeats, you can read his epitaph. It says, Cast a cold eye on life, on death. Horseman, pass by. Cast a cold eye on life, on death. Horseman, pass by. Who's the horseman that Yeats is referring to? One hour south of Drumcliff, in the county of Mayo, you can see the gable wall where St. John the Apostle appeared at the National Shrine of Our Lady of Knock. St. John is the one from whom Yeats took the reference to the horseman. In the book of the Apocalypse, John saw a scroll with seven seals. And as each of the first seals were broken by the lamb himself, a horseman appeared. The fourth horseman is called Chloros in Greek, or plague. You might recognize Chloros. It's the Greek word for green, in which we get the English words chlorine or chlorophyll. It's a sickly pale shade of yellowish green, the pallid color of a corpse. This fourth horseman that John saw emerging was followed by Hades, who was to collect all the bodies of the dead and to receive them into the underworld. W.B. Yeats wanted to turn 
a cold eye on life and death. A cold eye is a blind eye. He was scorning the revelation of God in sacred scripture. But if you go to the book of Revelation, you see that the Lamb speaks to John and says, See. See clearly. See with understanding and light. It is an imperative and a command. In Greek, idu, I command you to see. Life and death. John sees that the Lamb holds the keys to life and death and that this is the reality whether we want to see it or to turn a cold eye and a blind eye to it. Over the last number of years, we've seen in Ireland that the Irish people, with a chorus of Caid Mila Falce, that means 100,000 welcomes, have invited death to Ireland. It has come in the changing of laws that are greatly displeasing to God. But not only that, they are deadly. But the Irish people are hoping that they can control death. They want that horseman of death to dismount and to go to work in a room specially prepared for him in our public hospitals. There he is to confine his work to a certain group of Irish people, the unborn, and the elderly who are judged to be no longer useful. And the Irish people want death to remain there and not to touch the rest of us. We just want to go about the business of living. We want to continue to eat our dinner, watch the television, sleep comfortably at night, have a laugh, and a pint of Guinness, maybe. <laughs> and a bet on the horses. And maybe buy a lotto ticket when we're at the petrol station. But death doesn't make deals. He has been welcomed, and now he rides forth, released by the author of life, the Lamb. He has been vi invited into our land, and he rides wherever he wants under the authority of the wrath of the Lamb. And we will all taste him. Abraham Lincoln said in his second inaugural address in 1865, that the terrible woe of the American Civil War was the righteous judgment of the Lord as punishment for the sin of slavery. If you read some of his speeches, he steeped in sacred scripture. That's the way they thought. They thought with the mind of God. And so Lincoln said that the blood drawn by the sword in civil war was a payment for the blood drawn by the lash in slavery. Blood for bloodshed. And so we recognize that our merciful judge is also a just judge. Therefore, today, choose life and go deeper, because the horseman of death is roving around. You can see it not just in Ireland, but in the world headlines. The prophet Isaiah promises that when the longed-for Messiah comes, the nations will beat their swords into plowshares and no longer lift swords against each other nor train for war. The same is found in the prophet Zechariah, who describes the abasement of the king, humble and riding on a donkey. This humble king, he says, will banish the bow of war and bring peace to all the nations. Where do we see this? 
This is not a description of today's world. Instead of rest, there is widespread restlessness. Why? Because God is absent. And without God's grace, man is left to the wickedness that lies within his own heart. And there is no rest for the wicked. There is no rest because there is no peace. Man tries hard to find rest and peace, but things are not working. In the social life of mankind, our foundational institutions, such as government, healthcare, education, and media, are not working for us, even though they are run by intellectually sophisticated men and women. And on a personal level, people cannot sleep at night. Children are the fastest growing group experiencing sleep problems. We are in our cars and in traffic much more than our parents and grandparents. And this is not attributable just to an increase in car ownership. We are relentlessly driving our cars for entertainment and recreation and food and retail shopping and the pursuit of fashion. And there is the new slavery of technology and phones that never let us rest. And yet, we wonder, eaten bread is soon forgotten. We have forgotten that our rest is in the Eucharist. Don't forget Jesus or you'll die. He uses the word remain nine times in the Last Supper discourse in John 15. It means linger, abide with me. It also means stand your ground no matter what's going on around you. And it also means keep watch, keep vigil. It is the word remain. We learn to listen when we stay with him and stay silent. The divine persons speak a language which takes us beyond the analytic created order and into mystery. You can train your ears to hear the wind. This is what Jesus was teaching Nicodemus about the life of the Spirit in John 3. When you listen to the Holy Spirit, he teaches you about divine and eternal life so you may adjust the course of your life and fill your sails and go where he goes in the mission of the church to follow Jesus in his life. Remember that in the Eucharistic discourse in John 6, I mentioned that Jesus uses the word life 19 times. There is one other person among the large crowd listening to Jesus who uses it too. When Jesus is finished speaking, when most have turned away from this hard teaching, it is Peter. He has listened and has recognized this truth, that the Eucharistic teaching is about life, about Jesus' life. He says, you have the words of eternal life, he says. He chooses to stay with Jesus. He chooses life. Thank you and God bless you. Problems, worries, sadness. Are you seeking solutions? Bible says, do not be anxious about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Choose faith over fear.